Hello everybody and welcome to our live online subject spotlight politics session on protest, propaganda and pandemics, the politics of COVID-19 as part of the University of Chester's online kitchen sessions programme. My name is Mags and I am one of the schools and colleges liaison assistants at the University of Chester. Today I am joined by Dr Mark Bendel and Christopher Robertson, lecturers in the Social and Political Science Faculty, who will be delivering the session today. Say hello both. Hello. Hello. You'll see them shortly. I'm also joined by Helen, who will be helping to moderate any questions as they come in. Say hello, Helen. Hello, everybody. In terms of how today will work, I will shortly be handing over to Mark for his presentation and then I will be handing over to Christopher for his presentation. During each of the presentations, you will be given the opportunity to ask questions in the chat function on the right hand side of the screen. Your audio and video won't be shared, but you can ask questions anonymously if you wish. You just need to have ticked the box to say that you wish to be anonymous. You can like other questions that people may have asked and answer any questions that Mark may ask by responding in the chat function. Helen will collate any questions and Mark and Christopher will respond to these at the end of the session. If there's not time to answer all questions, the answers will be published on the website at a later date. At the very end, you will have the opportunity to complete a short evaluation form. Any links that we put up during the presentation will also be available on the recording. OK, I think we're ready to start, so it's over to you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Max. To mask or not to mask, is that the question? This unusual time, the, the new abnormal that we're all living through, how do we make sense of it? What stories do we choose to believe or do we choose to reject? Um, and the notion of stories and competing stories will be one of the overarching themes of the presentation today. So um, the politics of COVID-19, there's been a, a myth, a myth I think that affected the education I got at school, that the West was always superior. Um, and this myth of Western superiority has been very much exposed and undone by COVID-19. The idea of actually the West behaving like rogue states, as Noam Chomsky's talked about, I think has been very, uh, very clear. Um, if Western states have messed up their responses to COVID, how do they deal with it? And one of the ways they deal with it is by a blame game, as Matthew Flan Flinders has talked about. So we'll be thinking about who gets the blame and why, and why blaming is a story that, that is an overarching frame for this topic. Um, where does this blame come from? Does it come from the top? Does it come from political leaders? Or is it generated from below? Is it generated by social media networks or fringe groups or conspiracy groups? And where do figures at the top in sometimes, sometimes connect with those fringe groups that, uh, that are below? Um, where does this also promote political protest? And where does it promote suspicion about formal political processes. If individuals feel that politicians aren't listening to them, where do they go uh, to be listened to? And overarching this is the question for democratic states. Can democratic states cope with this kind of emergency? And if they fail this test, what will come in their aftermath? So these are some of the issues sketched out today and we'll, we'll look at as many as we can in the time that we've got. Sorry to interrupt, Mark. Would you be able to play your slideshow? Somebody's asked in the comments. Uh, just, just makes it a bit bigger. If you go to slideshow and start presentation. Slideshow and then from beginning, is that? Uh, from the slide you're on, from current slide, be fine. Current slide. OK, does that, is that better? Thank you. That, yeah, that's much yeah. better. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so one of these um, one of these stories is the story of the so-called China virus, part of this this blaming and this generating of of hate. Um, and we see that uh, Mr. Trump has referred to the pandemic and the COVID virus as Kung flu. And this isn't just a joke. This is very serious and has serious political purposes. 
So what this is about is generating dislike, fear or, or at worst hate towards external groups. So this is an emotion and a blaming for a political purpose. One way we might talk about this academically is Orientalism. Edward Said talked about this. So it's when particular cultures will choose to blame another culture, when a Western culture blames an Asian culture for being dirty or impure or uh, treating animals in a way that um, another country may not. And it's a way of devaluing and rendering as inferior another culture to justify, in some cases, abuses or even uh, physical violence against another nation or citizens of that nation. Uh, we see that there's a link between the way that people generate stories of blame and the way individuals are actually treated. So from comment to actual behaviour. And we see that, for example, the second point there by Grierson, uh, that Southeast Asian communities in Britain and elsewhere have found that they are more subject to hate crimes, to attack, to jokes about uh, wearing the mask uh, when many uh, citizens in the UK and elsewhere weren't wearing masks. So the wearing of masks was, was seen as in some ways uh, deviant and strange and dysfunctional and a marker of, of their ethnicity. Um, so this is the concern when political figures send out signals that are that are racist, that are stigmatizing, um, it does actually have real world social impacts. Um, this also deflects blame when political leaders blame external nation states uh, or minorities within nation states. Uh, this deflects blame from their own competence when their competence becomes subject to discussion. And this also has uh, an international dimension. Some of you are thinking of studying politics and some other students are thinking of studying international relations. And we see that there's uh, a strategy by the United States, particularly the, the neoliberal right in the United States, to isolate China, which is a strategic competitor. And we see that the United States under Mr. Trump has been building alliances with Australia, with Japan and with India, and is engaged in, in a trade war um, and a trading of, of insults with China. So serving to isolate China by uh, blaming China for the virus and blaming China for Americans losing their jobs uh, serves this, this wider purpose of isolating uh, a particular competitor. Um, there's also this blaming of multilateral organisations. So, you know, the defunding of the World Health Organisation right at the time of a pandemic, uh, actually undermining those organisations that are dedicated to trying to solve the pandemic. So this might seem counterintuitive. It might be not what we expect. And yet it fits into this uh, this withdrawal from the multilateral that uh, Mr. Trump has presided over over the last few years. An uh, interesting irony is that under Mr. Trump's reign, some, some nation states were referred to in fairly abusive terminology. For example, some African states were referred to as shithole countries. And yet a, a lot of the data suggests that that Africa has handled the coronavirus crisis a lot better than the United States and has something around 5% of the total global deaths, despite the fact that it doesn't always have uh, the, the level of medical expertise or resources that the United States has. Um, this issue as well of stories in motion and where do we direct our blame? Some of this is about where do we direct our hate? If, if that's how you respond as a citizen. Um, who are you going to blame for the closure of your business or the, the shuttering of your shop? And we see that uh, in the last year or so, some political figures have wanted to blame uh, governors. Uh, on the right there, you see Gretchen Whitmer. And again, this theme that uh, the wording and the stories that we use have a real world impact is illustrated by what happened or nearly happened to the governor uh, as she found that she was subject to, to abuse and also an attempt by a far right group to abduct her and take her away to, to uh, a woodland location. And it was only because the FBI intervened that this didn't happen. Um, so this is of, obviously of concern um, and this sort of weaponization of language and it's exciting of the, the far right to feel validated 
by the signals that they've been getting from the very top of the American political system. We also see that things that shouldn't be weaponized, like health advice that should be independent, also become weaponized by those in the White House and elsewhere. Um, so we see that, uh, in a sense, Mr. Trump created a new high risk group. Those who attended rallies, uh, Trump rallies, in a sense, became super spreader events. Uh, and there's a correlation between the number of um, events, live events that Mr. Trump attended, and then a spike in coronavirus, uh, coronavirus cases afterwards. We also see these conspiracy narratives feed in around vaccinations as well. And of course, just at the time that um, we're hearing vaccinations will be made available uh, for all sorts of businesses, um, potentially for students and others, um, and for older citizens, this lack of faith in, in science, in medicine, and this increasing faith in conspiratorial narratives, how far will this again have real world impacts? And will some citizens decide not to take uh, up the chance of a vaccination? Um, there's some interesting studies from uh, King's College London that shows that where we get our, our news from, our information about the virus impacts on our behavior. If you're going to look at certain types of social media, and that social media is propagating the idea that uh, the vaccine is going to make you ill um, or that the virus is a hoax uh, brought up by a, a one world government that wants to control us all, then uh, you're less likely to take social distancing measures. You're less likely to remember hands, face and space. And a lot of these issues, this sort of wariness of the state getting involved in our lives relates to broader sort of classical concerns that you might consider if you did a politics degree, such such as how big should the state be? Um, is it are we protected by the state when so-called Leviathan, if it comes into our lives and it tells us that we can only exercise um, on our own um, or in our back garden if we've just come back from certain countries um, in Europe, um, if it tells us we can't leave the country, um, these enormous restrictions on our liberty, are these things that are to be welcomed because they keep us alive or are they restrictions that, that we should fear? And we can see that there are some in the Conservative Party, the so-called sort of libertarian group, who feel that actually this is a sign of a, an overmighty state. So overarching classical debates about how big should the state be? I think, are, are debates that well precede COVID, but are brought to light by COVID. Um, other things, other trends that, that COVID did not invent, but in a sense, COVID put a, a shining light on, issues such as trust, and, and who do we trust? Who do we not trust? It seems that some politicians get lower trust ratings according to Ipsos than, than serial killers, whereas um, those in the university professions, professors and others um, are actually doing relatively well, scoring at around 86%. But this matters. Trust again isn't just something that's nice to have because a lot of the research suggests that if a population does not trust what a political leader is saying, uh, then they won't necessarily comply with that advice. And that's why Dominic Cummings, of course, um, Boris Johnson's chief of, of staff, uh, that's top, top SPAD special advisor, um, his unusual methodology for testing his eyesight before uh, before driving by going to Barnard Castle, which is what that is referring to there on the, the bottom on the right, um, that had a direct impact on citizens actually following advice in terms of lockdown and it seemed to give permission that if those who are devising the policy are actually breaking the policy then why should any of the rest of us follow it so um, political elites appearing to to break the rules isn't just a matter for them it has real world health impacts um, in terms of other research edelman's barometer of trust um, across 10 countries has shown that actually citizens prefer to hear more from scientists and less really from politicians. And what we have to be careful of with this blame game narrative is whether increasingly politicians will 
throw scientific advisors under the bus. We've already seen this with Public Health England that um, as the mismanagement of COVID, um, as that becomes increasingly evident if there are public inquiries, to what extent will those advisers that have been flanking political leaders um, be blamed for the poverty of their advice or perceived um, imperfections of their advice? So that's something that, that we'll have to be on the lookout for because civil servants have been uh, found to have been uh, blamed for political decisions in, in other arena. So what else? Um, this is a crisis then. Um, crisis is sometimes an overused word, but uh, with the, the death rate in Britain um, from COVID exceeding 50,000, if, if the pandemic isn't a crisis, then it's difficult to know what is. Uh, so with this straining of our political, social and, and economic fabric, um, this isn't just about elite behaviour or misbehaviour, but a splitting up of the social fabric that was going on well before COVID. Um, if we think of austerity and the, the policy of rolling back the state and withdrawing welfare provision, um, this has been going on for, as I say, some 10 years before COVID and has left some elements of the population particularly vulnerable. We see that this polarisation, this splitting um, of groups apart, so individuals feel they have less and less in common with neighbours, uh, with other regions or other nations in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Um, this was emphasised by the Brexit referendum and notice there the first point on the slide that 38 percent, so over a third of those in this study, uh, would find it difficult to be friends with those who voted on the, on the opposite side. And something that you might want to think about um, uh, if you're a, a student listening, um, have you picked friends or lost friends? Have you unfriended people who have a different political perspective to yourself? Um, so regional and class polarisation, we found that some of the, the poorest neighbourhoods in Britain are those that have had the, the highest death rates from COVID. We've also seen particularly the impact on ethnic minorities. Um, and uh, this has, has been a, a key issue in a number of nation states. Um, if you see there, uh, particularly sort of black and, and Asian on the graph on the right, um, Asian citizens have been um, heavily uh, and disproportionately affected by the virus. Um, and a, a recently uh, released report by the Joint Committee on Human Rights has shown that this kind of harm um, this, this social harm, this structural violence, one could call it, has been going on for, for many years. For example, if you're a black citizen, you're five more, uh, five times more likely to, to lose your child um, in childbirth uh, whilst being uh, looked after by the, the National Health Service than you are if you're white. So, so there's a whole spectrum of, of issues there where uh, BME citizens um, would justifiably feel that they're, they're not getting um, the same treatment um, from the, the state as others. There's also the issue of the overarching story, uh, economic story behind all this, neoliberalism, the idea that the market is always the solution, that the state should do less and less um, and that private companies should do more and more. Um, and this, as we've seen with the farming out of contracts to um, to Serco and Deloitte, not all those with a lot of experience of healthcare. Um, and in the UK, the uh, this mismanagement of, of test and trace in the in the past, this sort of feeds into a narrative that that individuals uh, who were already vulnerable are being damaged by this kind of structural violence, by ultimately what we could call the um, the virus of neoliberalism, which is infecting citizens, um, not just in the UK, but, but globally. So to, to wrap up, we could say that, that as um, uh, whether you're um, a, a UK based student or an international student, wherever you are in the world, uh, thinking about these issues, uh, civilization has, has a choice about which story to believe. Is it going to get excited by uh, race-based narratives that encourage us to fear the other, those who look different to us, whatever us is, um, as um, the, the what divisions between West and East increase, um, as those at the top, the so-called 1%, continue to fatten themselves on the ideology of neoliberalism, 
whilst watching and in, encouraging splits below. Is, is that the kind of story that individuals will sign up for? Uh, or will there be another story? Because, because of sustainability issues and because of climate change, we know that pandemics are more and more likely to happen. So can we come up with another story and another way of, of treating each other? Can we come up with another economic system? What would that be? And in terms of democratic states, will they be able to deal with these increasing sort of social divisions that have been driven by uh, an economic virus of neoliberalism? So these are the issues, and certainly at Chester, we take sustainability very seriously. It's on the agenda of the university, from the top of the university all the way down. Um, and we'll certainly be looking at, at stories that, that try and make sense of the world rather than um, split the world apart. So I think that is um, more or less it from, from myself. Um, happy to take questions and I gather now I unshare my screen. Thank you very much, Mark. That was incredibly interesting. I wonder if you, yes, you could not share your screen and there will be an opportunity for you to deal with some of the questions a bit later on. So thank you for that for now. So I will shortly be handing over to um, Christopher Robertson, who will be talking about COVID as a catalyst. So if you can just hold on for a moment for me. So. Mm. OK, thank you for that. Hold on a moment, um, Christopher, we can just hold on a moment. I'm just trying to get your. OK. <laughs> just be a moment. Sorry about the delay, everybody. Just a technical issue. Are you able to share your presentation, Christopher? Yeah. So, Mark, if you could just take yourself off the screen. If you just click on Chris now, Mags, that should work. Is that OK? We can see your presentation great. We're just trying to get you next to your presentation rather than Mark. OK, and that's fine. So to the right of the presentation, Mags, if you just click on the little picture and then click on Chris below, that should put him next to the presentation. Well, I can't see what you're doing. OK. Would you like me to try? Yeah. OK, I'm just going to send you live. Yeah, right, you're all, you're all ready to go, Chris. Sorry about that. No worries. Well, hello, everyone. I'll be continuing a few themes that Mark mentioned in his um, lecture slides, um, predominantly relating to trust um, and stories and protest. But I'll be looking at more the digital protest and digital activism that has emerged as a result of the restricted protest context of COVID. So I'll be looking at code as catalyst with the specific focus on the Yes Cymru movement, which is focusing on bringing uh, Welsh nationalism to the fore amidst um, COVID and utilising it as a political opportunity uh, in attempt to discredit Westminster and push the case for uh, an independent Wales. So Yes Cymru briefly just means Yes Wales uh, in a similar vein to the Yes Scotland campaign that emerged earlier in the decade. Um, it was formed in 2014, but then became formally organised in 2016 um, and had faced several different periods of time in which the movement gained more focus. Um, Brexit uh, represented a divided nation, uh, as did the rest, as with the rest of the UK. Uh, 2019 general election and now COVID, which has really brought the movement to its fore. Welsh independence is traditionally perceived as, as this fringe issue with only about 10% of the population traditionally supporting Welsh independence. 
uh, as Welsh independence is traditionally linked to the politics of the Welsh language, um, with, with it having a very much different divide internally compared to the rest of the UK. So language and culture was traditionally central in pushing the case of Welsh independence with Welsh speakers uh, and non-Welsh speakers traditionally holding different views and Covid has changed this and yes Cymru's and the digital movement has changed this by attempting to broaden appeal for the movement, make Welsh independence more accessible and less so a fringe issue and it's utilising a multitude of issues beyond the language to stake the claims for independence uh, and change the way which it's traditionally been framed and I'm using the term here of they utilised a group identity building so Covid has made it so yes Cymru can unify Welsh speakers, non-Welsh speakers, anyone who lives within Wales to feel proud of their nation and to feel that they deserve better from how Westminster is handling Covid and they should be able to uh, be an independent nation to handle it themselves not just due to the Covid epidemic, sorry pandemic but also due to a multitude of other factors but Covid has accelerated this uh, much further in the past year. So as I mentioned there's been historically low levels of support for independence, the devolution referendums to make the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Parliament um, very much differed, um, it was much narrower than Scotland when it was very much a three quarters 25 percent sort of um, support in case and it's generally been a lot more difficult to get people to support the case for Welsh independence. So this was a new movement built from scratch, uh, adopted Scottish iconography, so by that I'm meaning if we go to the previous slide the logos were very similar, um, some of the slogans were quite similar too and they were emulating a very visible movement in attempt to make Welsh independence more visible too. And the reason I'm looking at social media here is obviously with the restricted protest context, with lockdown, social distancing and so on, even though on the ground events have occurred during this period, social media has allowed people to discuss issues, to come across issues and to get engaged in political events uh, without having to formally sign up to trade unions, organisations and so on. But uh, pre-COVID, pre-lockdown and so on, um, the organisation did do marches, leafleting, uh, presenting stickers and so on. So it has used traditional protest tactics, but in the digital age with social mediums able to diffuse information far and wide, um, this organisation has arguably used it very effectively. So socio-political factors for pushing the case for Welsh independence, it links to a few things. Um, Welsh having its own independent media, it has BBC Wales, which but that's very much Cardiff centric and you know similarly into in England when um, a lot of things are seen as London centric, um, a lot of people feel that uh, Wales deserves its own independent media. It has S4C and Welsh language media such as that but uh, a lot of Welsh independence activists argue that as an independent nation they should have an independent media also and they should go hand in hand. This also links to Brexit and some authors argue that um, the English centric media caused Wales to vote for Brexit. Uh, the quote here from Jones saying the media in Wales are insufficient and depleted, the result is dominance by English media. So this person argues that a lot of the uh, opinions formulated during Brexit and causing Wales to vote leave were channeled through English centric media and but then what we're going to focus on here and what I'd argue is the breaking point almost and the massive opportunity provided to Yes Cymru of Covid-19. It's this dissatisfaction with how Westminster have been handling the crisis fueled by Covid is what I'm calling a political opportunity, um, an opportunity that is given to the movement or is seized by the movement to um, push its claims further um, that at another point of time it may not have been able to um, as you can see here on the left, um, predominantly on the bottom left hand corner, um, it's Yes Cymru's Twitter activity over time. So as we can see, um, when Johnson refused to sack Dominic Cummings after Bernard Castlegate, um, mentions of the movement uh, accelerated uh, exponentially. Then followed by the, when the Conservative MPs voted against free school meals, uh, in, again increased also but most exponentially recently when the Chancellor makes furlough more generous due to lockdown in England 
after denying it to Wales previously. The Eskimo mentions over 4,312. And while Twitter can't be the only aspect of public opinion here, this movement has gained a lot more social media following and it's made politic, well, people using this movement have found Welsh independence a lot more accessible to talk about and they're realising that they're not, maybe not the only person who's thinking Wales should be an independent country here. And it's made the movement a lot more visible and the cause a lot more visible than perhaps it was once before. So is social media a catalyst here? Well, COVID, it's changed the dynamic of the movement since its inception. Um, I will call what the movement did prior to COVID is digital prefigurative participation, where social media was used, but that was also that was using the lead up to online protests on the ground. So marches, strikes and so on. So now it's become this digital movement of opinion where people don't have to pay to join the movement. They don't have to be, uh, you know, signed up to anything. They can take part and leave as they wish. They can just follow the page and be exposed to the information online to learn about it. It's movement social learning, as uh, Gleason once called it. And the movement has utilised building on political opportunities, uh, what I'll call a specific political opportunity, specific to this movement's cause, that has accelerated the case for Welsh independence. And it's utilised what Bennett and Segerberg call personalised connective action. The movement posts a lot of relatable um, posts. It posts a lot of things that relate to your everyday life, uh, visual iconography that relates to people, that makes them think, yes, you know what, why isn't Wales an independent nation? Um, and fundamentally, the movement is flourishing and also creating visible results. Um, the historical Senate debates in the, in the Welsh part, uh, Welsh Assembly was discussed on the 15th of July. It's the first time that Welsh independence has been debated in there. And while it was rejected, it does show that these things happening online, alongside a multitude of other factors too, fostered by COVID, are causing Welsh independence to become a lot more of a visible issue. Even just last week, Welsh independence was, and yet the Yes Cymru movement was referenced in more mainstream media than it may have been once before. And it's becoming a lot less of a fringe issue and a lot more of a broader issue. And this increase in support is becoming very noticeable. Uh, you can see on the top left, um, support for Welsh independence in a YouGov poll was now hovering around 25%, which whilst not being much, uh, it's an increasingly growing minority of people are supporting the case of Welsh independence, as opposed to the um, historical hovering around 10%, not increasing factor. So again, is it a catalyst? Well, yes, in a way. It's reducing the threshold to participation. People are learning about these things through a movement specifically wanting to accelerate the claims for Welsh independence. And a lot of not just catchy slogans, but very well designed pictures that are booming up on people's Twitter feeds. And they're seeing this and thinking, well, what's going on here? Big enough, rich enough, smart enough, had enough. Hashtag Indie Wales has become the almost emblematic hashtag of the movement. Westminster isn't working, independence works. It's these almost emotive messages which are pushing the case for Welsh independence through social media, which is becoming a news source for many. And this movement knows this. They acknowledge Twitter's eye-catching information diffusion, the ability to do this, the ability to um, diffuse information within and between networks. If someone who follows the page, then retweets that image, then all their friends and followers will see that too, which they may go on to retweet too. And even if they don't, they'll be aware that that movement now exists. And the movement itself has got a very high engagement with other local groups. There's a lot of different factions of Yes Cymru, uh, as opposed to just the national hub. And there's a very high brokerage and engagement with these, showing that it's a Wales in this together, not just uh, a small minority of people wanting the case for independence. It's becoming uh, very widespread across Wales and, you know, across parties too, um, with Plaid Cymru being traditionally the only party that would be uh, classified as uh, a Wales party. Now people from across the spectrum are um, wanting to push the case for independence too. So, I really like this quote. It was shared by Yes Cymru, but it was written by Colin Drury, a writer for The Independent. But it appears increasingly plausible that when the pandemic is finally over, there is one more death to add to its grim tally, that of the United Kingdom itself. The union is um, potentially going to divide. Um, yes Cymru want the case for Welsh 
you know, a, a national Wales, a, its own country. When Wales w was um, accidentally called on Sky News in a weather report the other week, a Republic of Wales, yes, Cymru went nuts. And they were like, yes, we want that. That's quite catchy. We want a Republic of Wales. And fundamentally, amidst COVID, amidst, as Mark said in his presentation, people trusting politicians very little, um, people in Wales feel that, well, some people in Wales feel that if they had their own nation away from the United Kingdom, um, then they, you know, they may trust their politicians more if they were acting just in the Welsh interest. Fundamentally, this movement is aimed to broaden the appeal beyond traditional factors to a mass audience. And as you can see from the top left in the activity on its Twitter page across October, it's had an increasing, uh, well, a very notable increase in amount of not just the tweets, but the tweet impressions, how many people it's reaching. Profile visits up 255.9%. A lot more mentions and increase in followers, which since this graphic is, I'm, I'm fairly sure, has increased to about 40,000 members now too. It's increasing at a monthly rate. So this political opportunity of discontent is fostered by its historical legacies to do with the media, to do with language, but then Brexit. But COVID has been the pole vault here, which has allowed it to gain a lot more traction. And COVID, in a way, has benefited this movement in this aspect. The fact that they've been able to discredit how Boris has dealt with what is going on here. And Twitter has, Twitter has been utilised in such a way by this movement. They're a very tech savvy group which has utilised this and gained not just coverage across Twitter, but also mass media coverage, which is very beneficial for movements to achieve to get into the broader public eye across those who don't use Twitter and read newspapers or through strikes and so on, seeing it in person in their town centre. Despite being, as I mentioned as well, despite being rejected in the Welsh independence debate, the fact that this is being debated on these high stages is a, a good, good sign for the movement and good sign for those who want Welsh independence. It won't be a, um, a fast journey, but it will be a journey which is worth following because it's a very interesting movement and COVID is really adding a lot more dynamics to this movement than ever before. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you very much for that, Christopher. That was very interesting. Both sessions have been very interesting today. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually put um, Mark back onto the screen to answer any questions. But just before we finish, I would just like to say thank you everybody for attending today. It would be great if you would be able to provide us with some feedback about how you found today's session. So there is a link in the chat for you to follow, which takes you to an evaluation form with just four questions on. It would be great if you could attend any of our future sessions. If you want to have a look at what sessions we're offering in the future, please check out our outreach page on the University of Chester website, where you'll find all our resources and information about the next events. So Mark and Christopher, are you ready, unmuted and ready to answer any questions? Yeah. Yes. Oh. OK, so yeah. um, we've had a, a few come in for Mark's session, first of all. Uh, somebody asked Mark, would you be able to explain what neoliberal means, please? Sure. Let's, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, yes, great. great. OK, so um, I mean, in, in, in basic terms, it's the idea that the market should be the solution, that instead of leaving it to the state to, to provide, for example, welfare, uh, to provide services that the more the market does, the better. So we can also see that in the context of austerity after the banking crisis, which was a, a multinational crisis, a, a global crisis. It wasn't down to any one particular party, even though some parties got the, the blame, some governments got the blame for that. Um, as a result of austerity, we see that some states shrunk in terms of their welfare provision. Some councils shrunk, uh, there was quite a lot of unemployment, but this this fed into this idea that the state should, should shrink and you should farm things out to the market. And we can also see this, just to briefly link it to, to COVID, the fact that um, so many private companies, millions of pounds have been spent on contracts for uh, Deloitte and Serco and other companies who 
uh, haven't really had much expertise in dealing with a healthcare emergency, that millions of pounds have been found for these private companies to undertake uh, track and trace um, and other initiatives and not particularly successfully in the majority of cases, rather than that being automatically channeled through GP surgeries um, or through other sort of traditional health networks. That's a choice. That's a political choice uh, to go through a private company rather than to go through um, existing uh, healthcare networks provided by the state. So that that is neoliberalism and part of the uh, environment we're living through at the moment and perhaps some of the uh, difficulties that uh, the government has, has faced or, or, or given itself over COVID is because of this default reference to private companies, uh, almost an automatic trust uh, in a private company to deliver something rather than tried and uh, tested services. So leave it to the market. That's the neoliberal agenda in sort of a basic terms. That's great. Thank you. Extensive answer. Um, next question. There seems to be growing polarisation on key issues such as race, Brexit, social distancing, Biden versus Trump, the vaccine and then growing levels of social and economic inequality. How does the level of polarisation compare to other parts of recent Western history? It feels like things are bad now, but how bad are they comparatively? Um, yes, it's uh... Uh, it's, it's an interesting question where where if we say it's a crisis, um, is it a crisis compared to the 1960s, for example, or um, before the Second World War and, and the Depression? And where do you go? How far do you go back? And it's also the, the, the comment by Wittgenstein, uh, who said that it's difficult to begin at the beginning without feeling that you've actually got to go further back than that. So. Um, yes, we, we, we don't have the crisis of um, of the civil war at the time that the political philosopher Hobbes was writing. Um, we don't have a, a general strike uh, as there was in the 1920s, although uh, some suggest that that's that's always a possibility uh, if if states don't um, don't deal competently with crises. Um, so states have had to deal with with social and racial class divisions. Um, if you think of the 1960s, you think of the Vietnam protest, you think of um, civil rights struggles, um, the different offer from Martin Luther King, assimilation work with the system or Malcolm X with something much more, much more challenging. So there certainly have been crises before, but um, I think what is distinctive about the last few years is that we have a figure at the top of the system, Mr. Trump who um, often people are saying, oh, well, he's losing the election, he's going away. But 70 million people obviously felt he was the preferred option and, and they're not going away at all. So the issues that Mr. Trump uh, raised and the issues that millions obviously found popular uh, are still with us. And what we haven't had before is those at the very top of the system retweeting um, they haven't had social media to the same level, but the use of social media and connecting fringe groups like Breitbart um, and fringe organisations and giving them mainstream publicity. This is something unusual and um, with social media I and mean, Chris will probably want to come in about social media later on. Um, social media means that um, political leaders can contact millions of individuals without having to go through um, the corporate press um, or other types of mediation. So if you have um, a political leader with a, um, a unusual sense of morality, shall we say, as politely as possible, um, as we've seen, this can cause real world harms. And I know, I think um, Helen mentioned there was a question about the Proud Boys, and this this illustrates the point about existing divisions and whether political leaders are throwing a match on the petrol that already exists rather than as Mr Biden promises to do to to ease divisions whether he will or not is an interesting question um, so when Donald Trump is asked to condemn white supremacy um, and he tells the Proud Boys to uh, stand by what does that mean? And I know what, uh, one or two people have asked, well, what about the Proud Boys? Is that something that you discuss? Um, and, and yes, um, this is something, certainly extremism, whether on the right or the left, is something that we're 
wanting to analyze and make sense of. Um, and the Proud Boys is a, a, a rather unusual far right organization um, which has um, an anti-Semitic, um, anti-Muslim, um, anti-LGBT agenda. It suggests that politics has become sort of effeminate, um, that democracy is effeminate, and there's different levels of membership. Um, uh, and it's associated with violence. Violence is seen as a solution to political problems. And if you're committed enough to this group, then you have to agree to be beaten up whilst, it's rather bizarre, um, beaten up whilst quoting several top cereal brands. I don't quite understand the point of that, but there's um, there's a connection with previous fascist movements. Um, Carl Thebelwhite has written about this. Um, this um, normalized sadism um, and almost also normalized masochism. So being prepared to take violence and being prepared to give out violence as a way of dealing with political problems. So if you have political leaders that already think it's appropriate to use violence as a solution um, and wish to call in the military when there are protests, you know, Black Lives Matter protests, etc. The, um, the connection between elites at the top who want to use violence and the green lighting to far right uh, or indeed fascist groups below that, that is something that I think is distinctive. Um, and disturbing in current Western, some Western democracies. Um, and I don't think we've seen that that level com connection of encouragement of the far right from above um, and social media, um, that that green lighting and endorsement um, in, in to the same level that Mis Mr. Trump has, uh, has encouraged. Um, I've mentioned social media, so I, I don't know whether Chris would like to come in here because he's doing quite a lot of work on social media um, and I don't want to um, hog this. Um, so Chris, are any reflections on, on social media um, and its impact on, on democracy, both um, negative and also positive? I feel that social media and democracy is very much a double-edged sword. Um, it's got a lot of benefits for democracy. Um, it acts as almost a communication commons for people to express their views, act as a kind of a what we call a public sphere for open discussion and so on. But then there's also the other side of the coin, which it fuels uh, disinformation. Um, mm. There's been Facebook and Twitter recently and um, having to deal with um, political advertising and Donald Trump, uh, Maverick, uh, Maverick's Twitter usage and fake news. Uh, uh, for such a common term to use. Um, simply put, social media and democracy is, it's contested and it is something we look at on the course a lot. Um, we have a module called political communication in which we look at how politics is communicated and digital media as well as traditional broadcasting uh, is looked at in this, but also the impact of social media on how it, um, you know, fosters misinformation during pandemics. Um, and social media and how it can be used for good on the other side. I, for one, like to look at both the positives and the benefits because there are both sides to it um, for politics. But ultimately, a lot of the social media and COVID in the mainstream media will look at it negatively and how these organisations are failing to handle misinformation and so on. But there are positives to it too. Thank you. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, we've got one more question for Mark and then a couple more for Chris. So last question for you, Mark. Um, how do you think Biden will deal with COVID? That's an interesting, interesting question uh, because obviously we've been focusing on the last few years and often academics are advised not to engage in futurology um, and to be mystic megs. But uh, the early signs are a little bit more encouraging um, than the, the predecessor. Mr. Biden has set up a, a task force and he's reached out to the other side, a whistleblower from Mr. Trump's organization, a whistleblower who, who expressed concerns about the way the Trump administration was mismanaging COVID, has been appointed. Um, the language, you know, the stories um, that have been put forward so far seem to be less about blaming um, other nation states um, seem to be more about an evidence-based 
science based agenda. Um, so so that is encouraging. Um, some of these initiatives may well go beyond whatever president does. So, uh, of course, we've heard about vaccines and shortly after the, the election, uh, we heard Pfizer and other companies. There's a kind of a geopolitical struggle between different corporations and nation states as to who can get the vaccine out. Um, and Russia has got a, a vaccine out before others. Um, so there's a lot of jostling over this because there's a lot of a lot of money to be made. Pharmaceutical companies um, are doing quite well, as well as Amazon. Some companies are doing very well um, out of the pandemic. They're having a, a good emergency. So um, something to consider there. And will those um, will those vaccines work? Uh, is an interesting question. And obviously there's a, a lot of peer-reviewed studies that will be published to confirm whether they work or not. But just to bring it back to the conspiratorial narrative, already we're seeing Mr. Trump saying that this announcement about vaccines has been released after the result of the election. So I think we'll also see lots of conspiratorial stories about a vaccine designed to benefit the, the Democrats or a vaccine that um, that might make you ill. So I think studying a university degree helps us because it moves us away from fake news, from conspiratorial narratives um, and helps us focus on on evidence. And when we hear things like following the science, politicians talk about, well, it also helps us think about well, what happens when the science is divided. Um, science isn't monolithic, it isn't one thing. So where do we go when we're not sure? We don't go to a tabloid headline, we don't listen or necessarily believe to uh, what a political figure says. What quality evidence do we look at? And peer reviewed evidence in journals is what distinguishes university study from tabloids um, and from, say, pre university work, A level work. So that's why we're in this business, I think. We want quality evidence so that we can make rational decisions, not conspiratorial. Uh, decisions based on panic and and fear. That's right. Thank you. And yeah, I suppose it's a case of um, what, watch this space. We don't know what's going to happen, do we? Yeah. So mm. right. So we've just under ten minutes left. So I've got a couple of questions for Chris. Um, the first one: Is it really feasible that a wider Celtic alliance will emerge in coming years with Cornwall joining Wales as a breakout state? OK, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> um, we haven't got too long left, so I'll just try and um, say my points quite quickly here. Um, we don't know, but there's a lot of things to consider. If uh, a Celtic alliance or a Celtic union was to emerge, um, how would you have a pan-Celtic broadcaster to represent the interests of all the nations? Um, how would it differ in each nation's um, support for the European Union, for example? Um, how would it you know who would have the most important role how would a, a central governance emerge if it were to unionize into a nation or would each say an independent entity with devolved powers um clearly um I mean, wales joining sorry cornwall joining wales as a breakout state uh, i can't particularly see that happening but again as this year has shown and as covid has shown in fostering say yes cumroon's case for independence anything can happen um a lot of it is speculative um, and a lot, a lot of the time the experts are sometimes confounded by evidence but clearly at the moment it's um, if a Celtic Union was to emerge it'd have to consider a lot of different factors for it to um, organise and function properly uh, in the light of um, recent developments. OK, thank you. Um, second question is any perspectives from those who've done the course regarding overarching themes? Is that for you or Mark? Well, Chris, Chris has actually done the degree at Chester um, and uh, he's, he's, he's done the undergraduate degree and he's gone on to do postgraduate study. So um, any reflections, Chris, uh, on overarching themes across them, not just things that we've talked about in terms of political communication, but uh, overarching themes um, that you recall, things that stood out for you um, mm -hmm. and what you feel you got from the course and what you would like to say to people that are thinking of coming to study at Chester, uh, that, that are thinking of doing a degree. What, why do you feel that they should 
do one and do politics. Well, I could just turn this into um, selling the politics degree, but I'll be honest. And um, I conducted the politics degree from 2014 to 2017. And one of the overarching themes you do learn, um, not to take a political standpoint, is just the emphasis of critical thinking, thinking outside your comfort zone sometimes. You're exposed to a um, array of broad and critical ideas which, um, you know, make you think outside the box, anywhere from British politics to sustainable politics, as Mark mentioned earlier, um, to um, the art of war in your third year, where you look at um, texts from, say, Sun Tzu and Clausewitz about war. Uh, and in your second year, the individual and the state, where you look at the individual state relations, as Mark mentioned earlier, Leviathan, does the state have too much power? Should we have small government? Um, political theory as well, the social contract between us and the state. We get we give up certain freedoms to the state so that they protect us. To what extent is this social contract um, balanced out? Do we feel we're getting a good contract out of this? Y you learn an array of different things and the course is very flexible to your needs and wants. There are core modules, but then you have a very much of a flexibility to choose optional modules to tailor to your interests. And that is culminated with the dissertation module in your third year when you can choose to do a dissertation on a topic of your choice and basically write a big document on something you're really interested in. But the, the module really prompts critical thinking. The lecturers are all very approachable and are wanting to make you be your best self and achieve um, above and beyond. Um, fundamentally, it's um, a very good course. I'm not just saying that because I took it myself. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it and fundamentally politics is a great place or well, politics is a great subject to study and chess is a great place to live and study too. Oh, thank you Chris. Um, I've just noticed there was one more question if you could quickly have a go answering. Um, sure. how, how will the different ways in which Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland and England have handled lockdowns impact on future independence bids? Okay um, with that I feel that again another interesting question it's the lockdowns have really showed the ability for these nations and their leaders to demonstrate their leadership qualities and to show how how capable they are under pressure, so to speak. And the the, the really interesting area for me, uh, alongside Wales, is Scotland and how Sturgeon has been perceived as handled handling this. And John Curtis, who's a um, leading professor in politics up at I think it's the University of Strathclyde. Uh, has argued that support for independence has increased in both those who voted to leave the European Un Union and those who voted to remain. And according to a YouGov poll from August, support for independence, uh, according to this poll, was now about 53%. So whether this is linking to um, how Sturgeon's handled the crisis, um, it could just be a pure coincidence or it could be Sturgeon demonstrating her qualities as a leader. The future independence bids, it's again, Scotland's probably got the best case for it in the fact that an independence referendum has been held before and is very publicised and visible and Indy Ref 2 is on the agenda now. But for future independence bids, as I've mentioned, Covid has accelerated Yes Cymru's framing of Welsh independence um, and broadened the appeal of it. So I think in the next period of time, well, support for Welsh independence will continue to grow and that may continue to push the case for more visible political action, um, such as maybe an independence referendum. That's great, thank you. Uh, there's no further questions. Good. Well, thanks very much. And I, I know um, uh, Helen and Mags have some some roots, uh, roots in, in Wales, uh, so this presentation may have some impact on, on yourselves and your own reflections on, on, on Welshness. Thank you very much for that, Mark and Christopher. A very thoroughly interesting session today. Um, and obviously both myself and Helen, who do reside in Wales, will look forward to see how things develop as COVID as a catalyst. So thank you very much for today's session to both of the presenters. And thank you, Helen, for um, moderating all of the questions so easily and so um, genuinely interestingly to the uh, presenters. That's all from us for today. So thank you very much thanks for the everybody's audience. attendance. Thank you. And thanks to the audience too. Thanks for giving us your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.